fires it. Center field. Brandon Nimmo back. Seven hitter. It's seven consecutive games with a Joey Votto record. He breaks his own franchise record. Nine home runs in seven games. Nine of his last ten hits have left the ballpark. Hey, this is John Sadak, TV voice of the Cincinnati Reds, and you're up for late night Reds talk. What is up, everybody? It is Wednesday night, and you know what that means. It's another installment of late night Reds talk, celebrating our beloved Cincinnati Reds, who are, in some reason, for the first time in a long time in August, in the playoff running. So we're excited to be talking about that with one of our favorite people for our guest today. Uh, I am Tim Daniel, as always, joined by Mr. Nick Kirby. How's it going, man? Oh, what's going on? Just uh, celebrating that big Oakland win this afternoon. Yes, the Oakland A's get a big win to help the Reds out. I will not say anything ever again about opposition of the Reds because every time I do something bad happens. But we are joined by our guest. He is the talk host for ESPN 1530. You can see him at the Reds games dunking cups occasionally. This is that's Mr. Great. Mo- <laughs> that's that's what you want to be known for. That's that's what we're that's what we're aiming for. I made it nicely. Uh, I came in the room and Carlos left. I, I don't, I, does he not like me? Did I say something? I don't think that's what it is. I think he just dropped out. He's, uh, uh yeah, Mo's here just to hell with this. I'm not going to waste my time. You've had some esteemed guests on this show. And now you have a guy who's now known for dunking beer cups. Wow. That's not what you're known for. Uh, I watched this with uh, C Trent, who is the president of the baseball writers association of America, very prestigious thing. Right. And deserve it. I mean, it's, you know, C Trent's the best and he's up there. I'm watching him in Cooperstown the other day. He's with Al Michaels. He's with Hawk Harrelson. He's with all these uh, distinguished honorees. You had him on this show and now you have uh, a, 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 a carnival barker who dunks beer cups at the ballpark. Must be. I- I played a part proud. in that. I played hey, a Carlos part in is cups. back. I was <laughs> I was starting to think it was something I said. I yeah. <laughs> so join us. Yes. Welcome back, Mr. Carlos Guevara. Thanks for thanks for joining us, buddy. We're happy to have you back. Uh, so Mo, obviously your first time with us here on Late Night Reds Talk Live. We're excited to have you and got to get into a bunch of questions about the team's success. But one of the things I kind of am curious to ask is now that you've, you know, we just had this incredible Joey Votto run where he was hitting seven straight homers. I mean, nine homers in seven games, you being in Cincinnati media, you've seen this guy his whole career and this conversation has come up. Is this probably, even though with the MVPs and the incredible seasons he's had, has this been the most fun season to cover Joey Votto for you? Yeah. I, you know, I, I was, I was telling somebody today beyond Joey Votto, this season's been a talk show host dream. And as somebody who, you know, season ticket holder loves the team, cares about him, all that stuff. But I mean, just the highs and lows of this season, you could say a lot of things about this team, good and bad, which you cannot accuse them of is not engaging people and not being interesting. Uh, and, and at the front of that list is Joey Votto. Um, number one for the season that he's had. Number two, there has been this run. He's always been an interesting guy. He's always been, a, I think, a funny guy, but he's, it, it's taken a turn for the better, and it's coincided with this run that he's gone on. Um, and it's, it's done two things. Number one, it's come at the precise right time. Uh, I think the guys on the TV broadcast – I don't know if it was today or last night, but they were talking about the fact that, you know, this has occurred at precisely the right time, right? You know, you're without Nick Castellanos after that dreadful homestand to start the second half of the season. It kind of felt like the season was kind of, you know, uh, hanging by a thread and, and Joey goes crazy. And, you know, I mean, there was the game in Chicago where he hits the two homers and makes the play where he starts the double play. Uh, reaching into the stands or, or to the netting, I guess, whatever it was. And, uh, and it was, it was a guy doing everything. And this is a player who is often uh, I think quite mistakenly been referred to as not clutch. You know, he doesn't come up big. You hear that all the time. And it's, I just, that's such a lazy argument. Uh, This is the epitome of a guy coming up huge for his team at precisely the right time. The other thing it's done from my vantage point, um, the, the two athletes in this city that we have talked about the most, uh, since I started on the air in 2007 are Andy Dalton and Joey Votto. I get why Andy Dalton was polarizing, right? Because he was okay. 
Joey Votto somehow became the most polarizing guy we talked about. And I, I mean, I've said this often in recent years that I'll never forget sitting there in the summer of 2013 as he's having a great year for a pretty good Reds club. And the guy that everybody would want to talk about was Joey. Is he walking too much? Is he ever going to live up to the contract? Did they make a mistake? And I'm like, you know, th this team's got a lot of problems. He's not one of them. I, I think what he's done this year is I believe he has finally won over some holdovers. You're always going to have people who solely look at him through the lens of how much money he's making and nothing he does is going to be enough. He can hit 450 and, and, and hit a walk-off homer in, you know, the bottom of the ninth inning of game seven of the world series. And it's, it's just not going to be enough. I think he has earned uh, perhaps the, the, the begrudging respect and admiration of, of fans who were holdovers. And maybe it's because he's doing something as simple as hitting more home runs. That has been the interesting part to me is I finally have heard from a lot of people who said, you know, haven't always been a huge Joey Votto guy, but I like this version and this team, you don't know where it would be without him going on this uh, offensive surge that he's gone on certainly since he came off the injured list, but, but specifically here the last couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, I think the coming out of the shell thing has been really good too. Like you said, like he's always been kind of funny and kind of had a dry sense of humor, but you know, today he's on Dan Patrick and had a great like 15 minute segment where he was really funny and really like thought, like thought provoking, always been kind of that kind of guy, but seeing this now has just been really fun and dynamic for him. Um, you talked about, this is kind of a, a radio host dream team. Um, we've, you know, this is our first year with this podcast. So we've had an absolute blast talking about this team. Mm -hmm. What's really kind of jumped out you, to you the most was like good and bad, obviously bad. You know, it's easy to say bullpen, Brad Brock, Amir Garrett guys today who kind of had rough outings. Um, but really kind of like just the joy you're seeing and everyone picking each other up and just like, I don't know if I've seen a Reds team, this close necessarily and this exciting to watch yeah I, I think from a from the standpoint of being a fan and interacting with fans every day um i go back to game two the nick castellanos thing because at that moment you could feel you know with cincinnati there's always sort of a an us versus them sort of mentality and i i think sometimes it's it's overblown but th there was this sort of catharsis of, of watching Nick Castellanos yell at a St. Louis. It could have been any St. Louis Cardinal. It could have been the corpse of Red Shane Beast. And I think Reds fans still would have uh, rallied around that. There was something cathartic about that. Then there was something, you know, it just, it, it sort of rekindled, you know, what it was like to watch the Reds have a rival or play in these, you know, hugely intense games. And then baseball suspended him. And so fans rallied to the defense of this player who is, you know, really the heart and soul of this team. And so I think from the get-go, it's been fun to watch fans rally around this club and get to know some of these guys. Um, we're, we're making a case for Jonathan India to be the rookie of the year who aside from folks like yourself, who are hardcore people really knew much about him. And you know, what a, what an addition to this club he's been. Uh, it's, it's been, it's been things like that. It's been watching Nick Castellanos uh, very organically turn into a, a fan favorite, you know, a guy that, Everybody was excited that they acquired, but you know, let's face it for the most part, he had played in the American league for a team that hasn't been that good in a while, sort of, you know, toiling pretty anonymously. And he comes here. Uh, his season last year was quiet. It wasn't bad, but it also wasn't great. And then he's become sort of the, the emotional core of this team, a leader, certainly very productive. So it's been fun to watch people rally around that. And then the other part of it is th this has been the first year, and you guys see it all the time on, on social media. Um, this has been the first year uh, since I've been doing radio that we've talked extensively about the role of ownership in, in the, the construction of the club. And it, that's been an interesting juxtaposition that, that it's, it's a team that people like it's an ownership group that people are uh, distrustful of and, and that they're not, uh, that they, they're skeptical of and that they are, very critical of and you know there's i i've always i've always you know in, in doing the the job that i have whenever anything goes wrong with the Bengals, whenever anything goes wrong it doesn't matter what it is there are people who default to let's blame mike brown and sometimes that criticism is is earned uh sometimes it's overboard uh, and, but I've always felt like, you know, this, this guy, no matter what happens, can't get a break. And then I don't know that Bob Castellini has been a terrible owner. I don't, I, I certainly don't view him as a sinister man. Who's 
you know, sat up in his office for 15 years, firing people left and right, you know, doing everything he can to, 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 you know, put pennies together at the same time, the performance of the club over his 15 years has been underwhelming relative to what the expectations were when he bought the team and what they did this off season did have a direct impact on the on-field fortunes of this year's team. And people have noticed and they're angry. And, and, and even if they're not angry, they're again, skeptical of and mistrustful. And that's where the blame goes. You know, uh, we've talked less about the role of David Bell and, and, and sometimes less even about the team itself. And when everything, whenever anything goes wrong, the finger gets pointed right or wrong uh, at team ownership. And again, I think some of the criticisms are very valid. I, I think some go drastically overboard, but you're always going to have that. That sort of contrast has been really interesting to me because in years past, and I think this is probably true around baseball in years past, when the, the Reds haven't been very good and God knows there's been a ton of years like that, the finger gets pointed at uh, the system, economic disparities in the sport, uh, bad players, bad manager, whatever. We don't talk about ownership. And this year it's look, the players are fine. The people running the club are doing everything they can to put a good product on the field. We don't know about this owner. Uh, and that has been, that's been very, very interesting to, to watch unfold. Well, you know, I, do, I made the joke at the beginning of the episode about you and I both participated in the adding to the beer cans, the beer cups, and you know, you, why you, do we have to keep coming back to that? I have a point. I have a point. <laughs> the point with it is, you sent out a really awesome tweet, just kind of speaking on behalf of Reds fans that night about like, look, these are actual fans. These guys are here because they want to be here. They miss the stadium during the pandemic. They love being here. You feel this energy back in the stadium as far as the fans that are there. It feels like every night people are into every out. And I don't know if we've really felt that maybe since the 2012 giant series, no one wants to talk about. Yeah. I think my um, general point was uh, this town is dying for this team to win. You know, whenever I hear people talk, well, you know, it's, it's apathy setting in and, and younger fans, they're, they're becoming detached from the reds. This town is dying for this team to win. And they badly, I mean, it's, you know, I, I get, I get upset when people throw attendance figures in my face and I'm like, number one, it's, that's a little bit of an outdated metric. N yes. Number two, you know, look, they, the team over the last 30 years just hasn't been great. You know, what do you want? People are going to stop going. They're going to get out of the habit of, of going to ball games. So th there's a lot of different sort of anecdotal factors that go into why people go or, or don't go. But I, I, I just, if you ever needed an illustration as to, uh, the the thirst and the appetite that people have in this town for this team to be good go back to right before Christmas 2018 when uh, the Reds traded Homer Bailey for four breathing people which is a miracle I, I mean the, the fact that they got four human beings who who have a pulse for Homer Bailey was was nothing short of and I know there were prospects involved and they've been in the news over the last uh, couple of days or so but so they make this trade and the only guy anybody cares about is the SEL Puig, right? And I'm looking at it going, well, you know, Alex Wood was an all-star. And this Kyle Farmer dude looks like he could play a couple of different spots. And Matt Kemp dated Rihanna. So, I mean, this is this is pretty good. Uh, and, and that trade turned this town on its head. I mean, it just, it turned this town on its head. And people were uh, so excited and so fired up. And for a team that still at that point was most likely going to come in fourth place, uh, they were just excited for, we got a guy that we've heard of. We've got a guy with a personality and now the team is probably not going to win, but they're not going to lose as much. Folks got really excited. And by the way, the Reds drew about 2,200 fans more per game that season, 2019. So uh, it, it was the, to me, the perfect example of, you know, th there, this is a city, this is a fan base that's just dying to latch onto something. Even during those really awful years when we were latching on to, Scooter Jeanette and Derek Dietrich. And I mean, it was just people would develop fervor for players on a team that was awful. So now you have a team that's competitive at worst players with big personalities who seem to want to embrace the fans. It just, it excites people and it excites people that deserve a winner. And uh, I don't know if a bunch of people, you know, flinging back beers and building a beer snake is the best way to sort of, uh, you know, best thing to point to, but, the, I just I, I can't help but think as, as the season has gone on, 
what if what if by the time the gates opened, what if ownership would have done everything it could to give this team a chance? Number one, how good would the team be? Number two, how much more would people be ready to embrace this club? But but again, getting back to those people that night, those were people that came to watch at the time what what had been a you know a pretty uh, a team that was kind of straddling around five hundred. Uh, really didn't look like there were going to be a bona fide contender. Uh, and, and you just, you just thought, God, these, these folks deserve more than they've been getting and maybe more than they will be getting from, from ownership since then the team has rallied. And, and I think fa- fans have rallied around it. So um, I, I, I kind of going to take credit out, honestly, because I, I feel like the fortunes of the team have improved since that night. So you're welcome. Well done. Bro. Well done. You you're brought welcome. Luis Sessa here. I did. Yes. I wrote Luis says, yes, I'm the guy. Yes. <laughs> so Carlos, I was going to bring you into the conversation here because you are a former professional athlete. So you can kind of speak to another formal major league baseball player. So like what most kind of mentioning there, as far as like the fan base being behind the team and suddenly like, I assume like for you guys, when you go on the field every day, like you can feel that a lot more, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can even just point from like take to the minor league level because I spent a whole lot more time there, like playing in Dayton, Ohio. I mean, that was amazing. You had 13,000 people at each game and we were terrible. I've told you guys before, we lost 90 games in one year out of 140. That's a lot, but it was packed every time and you feel the energy. Every time I went in the ball game, I felt ready to go. You could feel the energy and then you take it on the other end of the spectrum and you go to the, the Florida State League where you're playing in major league spring training ballparks and there's 13 people in the stands and it's really tough to play in that league. And so, I mean, it's just like, like Joey said earlier today, like you feed off of that energy. You, you really do. It's not just, it's just not a figure of speech. It's, it's, it's actual, it's true. Was Chattanooga fired up every night when you guys were winning all all the time? Chattanooga was a uh, was hit or miss, but most, most I mean Thursday through Thursday through Saturday was pretty solid. Is that a beer deal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's when that's when the live music starts kicking at the bottom of the hill, and you can hear it. Can't wait for the game to be over. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So Nick, we'll kind of bring you back into the conversation too here. So obviously, I know you're the you're our number cruncher here. You're kind of seeing what this team is where they're standing now. I know we got a, sorry, Carlos, we got an Oakland A's win today for us. And unfortunately after Tim cursed the Milwaukee Brewers, what should have been a curse did not go in my favor. We're still kind of chasing there. What are you kind of looking at things go move forward for the squad? I know you had, was it 30, 31 games left against teams under 400 winning percentage? Yeah. I mean, 24% of the Reds remaining games are against the Pirates. So like one out of every four games left is the Pirates. Brewers only play them three more times. So and yeah, the Reds got a big hole, but you know, a lot of the reason, you know, you know, part of the reason for their hole is because the Brewers have played the Pirates a lot more than the Reds. I mean, so, I mean, you know, you can't ever bank on those games. You know, you have to play them. But um, I, I definitely think there's a lot of opportunities. The Reds have a significantly easier schedule than the Brewers. I think they have an easier schedule than the Padres, although the Padres do still play a ton of games against the Diamondbacks and the, the Rockies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think. You know, I think the schedule's right there. Um, this is a big, big, big weekend for the Reds coming up. The Reds are going to have four against the Pirates. Um, um, the Brewers are off tomorrow, so they could pick up a game. Um, uh, while the Brewers are playing the Giants, uh, the, the team that has the best record in baseball, that destroyed the Reds. So, you know, you hope that they, uh, uh, that they can keep chugging along. And got Reds target Chris Bryant, if you believe all the ESPN stuff that comes out. <laughs> yeah. and the Brewers have a lot of issues right now. They have like six six pitchers, I think, on the COVID IL. Um, yeah. So, so they're, I mean, they're really, I mean, they just, they just called up Sal Romano. That's, that's where they're at uh, with, with their bullpen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll see. It's going to be one of these week to week things. Um, my, my prediction is you'll see the Reds make a real big push. Uh, then you'll see them fall back and everyone write them off again. And then you'll see them make another big push and it'll probably be a couple of those for, for the rest of the year. And we'll see how it all shakes out. Yeah. I, I think that that's definitely fair. It definitely an analysis is to be there. Um, I think one of the things I was kind of, you know, Mo kind of talked about quite a bit as far as like the attention this team gets and not just here, but now you're seeing it nationwide. So I was watching MLB TV yesterday 
and it was the segment with Billy Rifkin and Cliff Floyd. And they asked Cliff Floyd, what's the percentage you have the Reds making the playoffs this year? And he said, 90% the Reds will be in the playoffs this year. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. So someone's drinking the Kool-Aid a little more than I, I was expecting. But, um, you know, I think with the soft presses was with Tatis on the IL is what he said. That's going to be a big effect. And like the Reds getting Castellanos back if he's healthy, which according to batting practice, they all things look that way. But I don't know if we can really put in the words just how much that would mean to this ball club to be back in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it'd be huge, you know. I mean, yeah, the, the team did make the playoffs last year. I think people forget it or they just write off last year's season. But, I mean, this is the, the first time since 2014 that we have a, a, a real season where the Reds are in the race into August. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think it's a big deal. You know, the longer they can – um, the longer they can hang around, you know, you never know what will happen this year with with all of the um, the, the pitching injuries that are really racking up. So, uh, yeah, if you can just hang around in the race, uh, you're always, I think, going to have a chance this year. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Mo, I wanted to ask you this because we had this question. I know you've answered this question a million times in your career, but we had a Twitter question today from someone who said, Something I hear a lot from Reds fans is how when we signed Brandon Phillips and Joey Votto to this big contract back in the 2010s, it really handcuffed the Reds' financial for the next for the next decade, and that is a lot to blame for the failure the Reds have experienced. Do you guys think that there's any truth to that? Um, did, did those uh, Brandon was traded at the end of 2017 or 16? 17, Six, 16, 16, 16, and 16. Those years all run together. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say they they really do all sort of run together. Um, I I kind of view them as separate entities. The, the Joey Votto contract you were paying for all of his prime years for a guy whose skill set aged well. Uh, when they gave Brandon the contract, it didn't feel like they were investing in a player's prime years. It felt like they were pacifying somebody who they thought was going to cause a problem if they didn't give him a contract Th those to me are two different things. Um, and Joey Votto gave them prime potent prime uh, production. I mean, you know, th there were years um, 15, 16 and 17 w without having the figures in front of me where, where you could look up, you know, the top 30, 40 highest paid players in baseball. And Joey Votto was near the bottom of that list and commensurate to the production he was giving the team every single year. He, I thought was one of the best bargains in baseball. You were getting exactly what you wanted. 2014, obviously, you know, he missed a hundred games and, and, and didn't play all that well, but I mean, you got all of his prime and his prime was really, really good by the end of the 2013 season, which was they signed Brandon to that contract in April of 2012. By the end of the 2013 season, I know Brandon dro drove in a hundred runs that year, but you could kind of look at this and go, all right, this is a guy who's kind of on the downside, uh, still capable of doing brilliant things defensively, not a bad player by any stretch, but it, it, you kind of looked at him and said, you know, the Reds are going to have a guy here who this is going to peter out. Maybe he doesn't get to the end of his contract. Maybe we get to a point where it doesn't make sense for him to play every single day. Uh, I, I think as long as, the guy that you've signed or the guy that you've invested in is giving you return on investment. I don't believe you could ever say, well, that handcuffs the team. Now, did the farm system dry up? Yeah, it, it did. I mean, you know, there was this stretch from 08 through, you know, really 2013, I guess, where there was a steady stream of guys coming up. Some of them were more successful than others, but just, you know, Cueto, Bailey, Stubbs, Bruce, Votto, uh, right on, you know, through a role as Chapman, ultimately Todd Frazier, Devin Mesoraco, just a steady stream of just guys. And obviously they traded, you know, Alonzo and, and those guys away for Latos and they traded away uh, Travis Wood. But but there was there was still this like steady stream of guys and that pipeline just kind of dried up. Um, I attribute that more to this long stretch of losing than anything else. And then hitting the eject button uh, way too late on, you know, we're going to trade Johnny Cueto, uh, the return, very underwhelming. We're going to trade away Frazier and, and Chapman and Bruce, and we're going to move on from all these cogs and they really don't get all that much in return. And you wonder just how could that have been timed better? I kind of view that as a little bit more responsible. 
uh, for what this team went through. Homer Bailey never living up to his contract. Uh, Devin Mesoraco to a large, to a very large degree, yeah. never living up to his contract. I mean, if you're going to look at financial decisions that came back to bite this team, I don't view Joey Votto that way, especially now that in his age 37 season, he's having such a good year. And now you look at it and go, God, you know what? The next two years, maybe he can still be a, a plus player. Uh, so, but getting back to the original question, I just, when they signed Joey Votto, most of us understood the financial ramifications. Most of us knew that that was going to mean there are going to be some of Joey's current teammates who they cannot invest in. Most of us knew there was a really good chance that nor- near the end of his career, they were paying for his past prime years but it's up to the team to win while he's here. And as long as he's giving this team the production they're looking for, if they don't win, that's not on Joey. And that's not on the contract Phillips. As, as much as we all love Brandon Phillips, who is a first ballot Reds hall of famer, one of the red, one of the most popular players they've had the greatest defensive second baseman I've ever seen by, by far, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you could have imagined, okay, at the end of 2012, 2013, maybe it's time to move on and, and you get somebody else. Uh, and, it, and, and it kind of looked like, God, I'm not sure that contract is going to age quite as well. And I don't know that by the end of it, if they try to move on from him, that they're going to get what they're looking for in a deal. And by then he's going to be able to say no to any trade. Uh, so I view those things as separate entities, but, but I don't, I don't hold, I don't hold the, I don't hold those contracts specifically responsible or mainly responsible for why the Reds didn't win during those, during the duration of those deals. I completely agree with that. I think it's also important to mention that when Vada won the MVP in 2010, he made 525,000 that year. (laughs) (laughs) He wasn't, he wasn't breaking the bank at major league levels. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've asked this question uh, not so much this year, but I mean, you guys all know, if Joey Votto hits into a double play with first and third in the ninth inning down by a run and there's one out and it ends the game immediately, immediately the reaction by some is going to be paying 25 mil a year for that. That is an awfully stupid way of looking at things. Um, Or if, you know, Joey, those three years, 15, 16 and 17 are, are three of the best consecutive seasons anybody's ever had wearing a Reds uniform. And you, you and I both know there are people that instead of, Uh, appreciating what it means and trying to put it into some sort of historical context or even lamenting the fact that the Reds wasted it will say something to the effect of, well, he should do that. He's making the kind of money that he's making. I I have asked this of my audience time and again, and I I never really get an answer. What, if, if you're going to, if you're going to dwell on the money, if you're going to focus almost solely on what his annual salary is, what can he do that in your eyes equals living up to the contract statistically and nobody has an answer i I don't i don't have an answer but but again i don't i I don't view him through the lens of well he's making 25 mil he better produce i view him through the lens of he's making 25 mil because he's likely to produce uh the, the thing that has always been amazing about him though to me and i think you're getting it a little bit less is the fact that folks have always viewed what he does both positively and negatively uh almost solely through the lens of, well, he's making this much money. And so he should do this, or he's making this much money. And so uh, he's got to come up big in every situation. It doesn't work that way. It's never worked that way. It's, it's never going to work that way. That's always been to a degree frustrating to me uh, because I'd rather talk about the player and what he's accomplished. And, and look, there, there are times where, you know, Joey doesn't perform well and it's a drain on the team, but I, I view it as well, okay, uh, Joey's hurting the team because he's not playing well, not he's hurting the team because he's not playing well and he's making 25 million bucks. I know the, the money goes into determining how often does a guy play and, and I, I, I do understand that. Uh, but the fact that people have spent so much time dwelling on it is something that I've, I've never really completely understood. Uh, and, and, and frankly, nobody has really explained it to me why they dwell on it so much and nobody's ever explained to me what he can do statistically that's going to make people go, yep, that's a $25 million season. It hasn't happened yet. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but you might have to be go, go through this again this offseason because Nick Castellanos can opt out of a deal. Right. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I said that the other day. I go, you know, we all want Nick back. I certainly would not begrudge him if he said, I'm going to try to hit free agency. I'm coming off a great year. I'm in my prime. Let's go. 
I think it'd be really fascinating to see how the, the, the CBA could have impact all that. But if you want him back, you're going to have to pay more. Well, well, guess what? Chances are he's not capable of doing better than he's doing this year. Right. I mean, statistically, th- there's a really good chance. This is his best season, much like 2010 was Joey Votto's best season. So then what's going to happen? You pay him more. The production looks the same and you go, well, wait a minute. We're paying him more. He should be doing more. And you and I, we all know that's how a lot of people look at these things. I, I it's not, it's, it's, it's great if it happens, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not possible. You get rewarded for what you did and you get paid to keep doing what you've been doing here. If that makes any sense, uh, not, we're going to pay you more. So you're going to have to start doing what doesn't work that way. Uh, but yeah, we could go through the the exact same thing with Nick Castellanos, and I know this is a, a Reds podcast, but we're going to go through that one day very soon with Joe Burrow in yes. Cincinnati, and that's going to be fascinating to pay attention to. Yeah. Nick, I know you were kind of the one that was like, if I was in my, those in my shoes, this is what I would offer, and that's why. And like one of the reasons you brought up was the age group, and you know, like Mo just said, this, I mean, this is probably the ceiling of Nick Castellanos, no disrespect intended, obviously. Yeah, and I mean, you know – we see how difficult it is to acquire people at premium positions for the Reds. So it's almost like that's where they, they got to be looking to spend a lot of their money. If they are, they got to be very strategic with it. But and the one point I would add on, on Votto is I would criticize more the Reds for wasting his 2017 season than anything else, because the rebuild should have been over by then. And that's my, I, my bigger complaint with with cat with um castellini more than the the average payroll was more that he cared too much back then that was i think the biggest mistake that he's he's made more so than the uh the year on in in payroll figures compared to you know other similar markets so i i don't know i mean it's it's all how how you're going to fit your puzzle with all your pieces and all your all your your dollars that are allotted with with certain guys who are on league minimum deals like Jonathan India is making nothing this year and he's producing like Jonathan India could be a top 10 MVP candidate like that's not that far fetched at, at this point so there's just so many pieces to uh, to building a roster that it it it's it's very it's very complicated you know to 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 have like a definitive is this the right thing is this not not the right thing but well and 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 what's what's always interesting about that from from the 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 criticism that and and look i've been very critical of bob castellini i I think he deserves a lot of it Uh, i think i've been fair i I think most people have been fair but you can't you can't say well he doesn't spend money he's cheap uh they don't care about winning and then say, well, they never should have signed Joey Votto. Now, now again, there are deals that backfire. The the Homer Bailey deal backfired. I, I understood the thinking at the time. I didn't love it, but I but I got it. Joey Votto, you know, I mean, all right, we're going to pay for a guy in his prime. His skill set's probably going to age well. He's he had been you know pretty durable to that point. This is before he got hurt in 2012. He's an MVP. It still looks like he has a lot of upside. He may be getting better. Um, this is the kind of guy you invest in. They did. And people get mad about that deal. So, all right, fine. Well, if you want the owner to spend money, chances are that's going to have to come uh, via deals that have some, some downside. And you then can't get mad every time the downside pops up. Um, That to me, you got to be fair. Now, if you want to say they shouldn't just give players away, which is what they effectively did this off season. That's very fair. That sticks in my craw. It, It bothers me. Um, I thought it was very short-sighted and, and obviously it's had a negative impact on the team and one that they're still trying to overcome. But uh, as a general rule, you know, there have been some deals that unfortunately were very expensive, very lucrative that unfortunately haven't worked out. I don't view the Vado deal as one that hasn't worked out. He has given them almost everything you could ask. Do I wish he would have been a little bit uh, more productive in, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, sure. Yes. Well, we all do, but players get old. We knew that we knew that when he signed the deal, you paid for his prime years, you got his prime years, you failed to win while he had his prime years and did so in, in, in part because the owner kind of meddled with keeping fan favorites and not wanting to rebuild when they could have rebuilt, but you, you can't, you can't get mad that he, well, he doesn't spend money and then look at the deals where he spent some money and said, well, they never should have done that. That was a stupid decision. It doesn't to me work that way. That's the thing I feel like I've been saying for years is like, when they were like, well, you know, 
they they shouldn't they, they really need to sign this guy back and they signed it's like well that was too much money why would you do such a thing like you remember they said roll to Chapman and everyone was like are we sure that that was the right move and it's like <laughs> yes he was tremendous let's call it what it was yeah and and they've also you know i mean i'll give them credit to to this degree Th- there have been some things that people clamored for them to do which in hindsight let's be glad they didn't do everybody remember keep scooter Jeanette yes. love scooter. But I mean, I had folks, Oh, you got to just get it done. I'm like, yeah, you got time on his contract. I'm not sure he's ever going to be better than he is right now. I'm not sure he's ever going to be as good as he is right now. Like let's tap the brakes. I went through the summer two years ago where it was or three years ago. Well, you know what? This Matt Harvey guy is throwing the ball pretty well. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, glad they didn't do that. Uh, they, you know, I mean, Johnny Cueto is one of my three or four favorite reds of all time. That Johnny Cueto contract in San Francisco has been mostly a disaster. Uh, and you know, people hated Homer Bailey. So it's like, well, they should have signed Johnny Cueto. Thank God they didn't. They, yeah. you know, and, and, and I, I'm a huge Johnny Cueto fan and I've watched him pitch, pitch this year. And I, I, you know, I'd love to see him get a chance to do something special in the postseason. but by and large, that contract has turned out to be a, an awful deal for the San Francisco Giants. There were a lot of people who just, you know, banged on the table and said, let's do that. Hell, in, in May of 19, I took one phone call after the next about how, well, you build a team around a guy like Derek Dietrich. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, can, can we see if you can have a second good month? Um, <laughs> a, a lot of the things that people have demanded the Reds do financially uh, have turned out to, to be you know, blessings that they didn't do them. Right. Um, so they've acted responsibly in some cases, but, but again, I, I think had this off season never unfolded the way it did, I don't, I don't really believe that folks would throw some of the big picture criticism at Bob Castellini that they have. I, I think what you can do is, is you could say, well, I, I wish they would have behaved differently this off season. I wish they would have uh, operated the team with the idea of we understand we're making, we're losing money, but let's try to build the best possible team so that when the ballpark gates do open up, people are rushing through them to see this team. Let's understand there's going to be a long-term financial benefit. Let's also understand there's a pretty good chance. We're going to have full fans in the stands by the middle of the summer. They didn't do that. I think they panicked. They shaved 30 million bucks off the payroll. I think you can be critical of that. I think you could also say, look, this is the owner who said, we're going to bring championship baseball to Cincinnati. There were no caveats. Uh, he said it, it was emphatic. He then sent out a letter to season ticket holders. I still have it somewhere. Here's what we're going to do. I think you're being fair. If you say, look, Bob, it's been 15 years and hasn't happened. What gives? I also think within that context, you can find a number of smart things, pure baseball decisions that this club has made financial decisions that this club has made that have turned out well, or even that didn't turn out well, but you can understand why they made them. Um, and now folks are unwilling to do that because of what happened this off season. I tend to think that you can sort of compartmentalize and say, here were some really good decisions they made. And, and here were some good decisions they made that didn't even necessarily work out, but you understood the thought process behind them. Oh, and by the way, a lot of that was sort of undone or the momentum stopped because this off season, they kind of panicked, gave players away and slashed $30 million of payroll. You got to keep Todd Frazier, right? That was the thing forever. <laughs> That's right. yes. that, that was another one, right? Yeah. And, uh, oh, he had won the home run derby. It's like, you got to give him, you got to give him, you know, 200 million bucks. I mean, again, you know, Matt Latos, I mean, uh, I think it was Buster Oney or David Schoenfeld. Somebody after Clayton Kershaw signed his $200 million contract. It was one of those two had a list of who the next $200 million pitcher was going to be. And Matt Latos was on that list. And I remember kind of looking at it going, well, you know, he's in his mid twenties. He's still got some upside and folks were like, you got to get it done. Now you got to get it done. Well, thank God they didn't. I mean, can you imagine, imagine that? So there've been some things that folks wanted them to do that they didn't do got accused of being cheap for not doing that ended up working out uh, the fact that they didn't do them. Was Mike Leak the, the best pitcher out of that class after left the reds. Yeah. 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 Who would have who would have thought that you know back yeah, in exactly. in 2012? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's so, the call. Looking through the chat here, we got a couple. First off, Sam Cooper, Zoom background rankings: Mo, Nick, Carlos, Tim. What's what's so bad about my Zoom background here? I like the sneakers. I like you the You might lady. be on the you might be on the toilet. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wouldn't go that far. Um, I like you guys too much. Uh, so. 
they had that with the mo congratulations i guess on that you're the first person to get that award oh boy uh, <laughs> uh max alfonso who is a regular he asked if there was one player from the 2012 team who would you add who would, that you would add to this team position players only i don't know if there's necessarily anyone i would hmm that's a really good question yeah like I don't know, do That's I put a... Stubbs over Tyler Naquin? I don't think so. Like, uh, yeah, I don't think there's. I mean, can Jay Bruce play center field? Can we cheat? Yeah. <laughs> can, can I? Can I take the best? Can I take that two month stretch where Scott Rowland, uh, his, he sort of uh, was alive again when? Remember when Vado got hurt that year, missed seven mm-hmm. weeks, and suddenly, Rowland and Frazier both. Uh, concurrently just killed it you know they put frazier at first base could i have that sort of uh run it back version of scott Rowland? and can i put him at third base not the guy who uh, struck out to end the nlds uh but some version of what they were getting at third base that year instead of maybe gino but aside from that i don't think there's i don't think there's anybody i think i'd take todd frazier over Got yeah, I, let's uh, Todd Frazier's either of those guys. Yeah, uh, but the point being, like, they both just both caught fire at the right time. But yeah, I'd take Todd Frazier, 2012 Todd Frazier over. over he had a higher OPS that year than Bryce Harper, who won the MVP. Yeah. Who was the and shortstop? He, well. And he saved a guy Cozart. from dying in Pittsburgh. Oh, that's right. It was it was Zach Cozart, right. not when Zach Cozart hit. Zach Cozart was uh, really struggled offensively and batted second for the the Reds in the postseason mm-hmm. well, that's a good yeah. spot yeah the, t- like the two guys two, above bottom of the line 90 like, on base yeah. percentage batting second <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty brutal wasn't very fun um well mel obviously this has been awesome i am curious because i know i like talking to stuff with you especially i know i joke with you all the time you're probably sick of my next questions um but when it comes to as far as like the broadcast team they have now, and this isn't a dig on to get the dig on the previous ones, and not just because John Sadek's our friend who promotes our podcast because he likes us. <laughs> just curious for you as a guy who works in sports media, who has been around a lot of these guys, like your thoughts on the current broadcasting teams. I know with Tommy Thrall now kind of running the radio program and John Sadek on TV, as someone who works in sports media and broadcasting, how do you view those guys for the job they're doing for this team this year? Uh, I think I think they're all very good. I wish the TV guys would be back on the road b- because I just I think their jobs would be so much easier and the, the viewer the viewer would be served by having them there. I, I know a lot goes into that decision, but uh, I wish those guys were back on the road because I think I think you can tell a difference. Um, I, I think especially if you if you watch critically and you watch closely and, and those guys all want to be on the road uh, so that that would be that would be my first thing i think with uh, with john um this is a uh, a parochial town man you know uh and and you get thrown to the wolves here um you're not from here uh you don't have a background here and and then you get the job and they go well you're going to work some games with Barry Larkin and then you know some games with Chris Welsh and you're going to work some games with uh, Jeff Brantley and you're only going to do a handful of spring training games um that's very very difficult I, I i could tell that the production they're trying to take the broadcast in the direction where uh they're trying to lean into analytics more and i'm 100% for that but i i think at the outset of the season it felt like they were all overdoing it just a little bit and that's 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 okay that's you know you've you've got to strike a happy balance um i think in a year well i think frankly we're going to be better equipped to answer that question after john's had a chance to do the games for a year have better access to the players during spring training have better access to the guys uh you know during a season then and hopefully you know a year from now it's it's the way it was pre 2020 but I think sort of working within those constraints, John's doing a really nice job. I love the enthusiasm. Um, <clears throat> I, I love the, the uh, I, I think he's great at asking his partners really good questions. Um, and that to me is the thing that has always made Dan Horde so good doing Bengals and, and UC yeah, games. He's, he's great at setting up his, his broadcasters uh, with, with Barry Larkin, uh, you know, Barry Larkin is my, my favorite all time player. Uh, he certainly adds a, a unique uh, perspective. I, I, um, 
and and he's never called games on a daily basis. And I know he's not calling them all. He's never called games on a daily basis either. I'd never probably met John Sadak before. I think their chemistry is a work in progress. Uh, I'll tell you what I really enjoyed is I, I enjoyed them throwing Sam Lequeur in the booth the last couple of games because it's it's a unique perspective. It's a different perspective. Uh, Sam has gotten a little bit more polished. Uh, and it's it's fun to listen to a pitcher and a hitter talk about you know their sort of specialties and, and combine them. On the radio, I think Tommy Thrall is great. I think Tommy, you know, I mean, y- you talk about a difficult gig. Um, and he had the benefit of sort of having his ring kissed by Marty because he was part of the broadcast in 2019, did the pre and post game, called some games. Uh, but you're replacing, uh, you know, say what you want about him, but one of the one of the most popular, one of the most accomplished, iconic broadcasters ever. You replace him. And then year one, you're calling games in empty ballparks or remotely. Uh, that could not have been easy. And I, I thought Tommy handled that very, very well. I, I think he and uh, and Chris Welsh and Jeff Brantley are are great together. Uh, and so I, I think they're doing a really nice job. There, there's certainly a, a, a there is a, a positivity to the broadcast that I think the Reds are probably encouraging. And, and they're not the only team that's that's doing that. I mean, that's just that's sort of how things are going right now. But I think all things considered, the, the broadcasters are, are doing a nice job. Nothing against anybody who was uh, in the broadcast booth here and there. But um, it felt like for a while, like it was, well, we've got the broadcasters we have now. And then uh, Doug Flynn's going to come do some games. And then, oh, well, here's Danny Graves. And the, well, we're going to bring back George Grant. For, and it's nothing against any of those guys. I, I think Danny Graves is, is really good at what he does. But. I, I, I'm, it's kind of nice as a listener. The one thing we're always taught in broadcasting is consistency is really important for the most part. When I turn on the game, I know who's on. And, and there was a time where for whatever reason, whether it was Marty taking time off, which great, or Tom taking time off or having a national broadcaster, we got to give Doug Flynn some games or now here's Danny Graves. Uh, uh, Sam's going to do some games on radio for the most part. It's pretty much, you know, these are the broadcasters turn the game on. It doesn't take forever to figure out who's on. I uh, really appreciate that. I like yeah. Barry Larkin a lot more than I thought I was. I, I thought mm-hmm. I would. I honestly, I went into the season thinking I was going to just dread it because of some of his previous games back when he was with ESPN. I think overall he's done a pretty good job. Um, um, I, he has work to do, but it's his first season. Um, I, I feel like he's overall has a, um, a good perspective, even if I don't agree with some of like the, the ways he thinks about, about baseball, like analytically, I feel like he at least is explaining things in a good, a good manner. And he's, I think he has a nice, a nice positive spin that I was not expecting from him. It's not, it, he does a pretty good job of not making it feel like, well, the game was better back when I played. That's what I thought it was going to be. And yeah. I feel like he has a good appreciation of the current game, which is, is I think, the, the, the most pleasant surprise for me. What you are getting from him is purely a player's perspective. And, and to me, it was illustrated. It was actually, <laughs> it was a somewhat uncomfortable moment where they were in Chicago. Or the team was in Chicago and Sadak asked Larkin, like, maybe it was right before they went to Chicago. In fact, I think it was. They, they were getting ready to go to Chicago And John said to Barry something to the effect of, well, you know, the Cubs, it looks like they may be sellers, but you know, they could be buyers. What do you think? And Barry said something to the effect of, I don't have an opinion because I just, I don't follow it. Well, that's what players do. Carlos, you know, like they're not, they're not the players just play. Right. And so if, if you put the game in front of Barry and say, well, you know, analyze this double play or tell me what the pitcher is thinking here or why did the the the, 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 you know why did the hitter swing at that pitch he'll do that for you that's his perspective but you know you ask most players you know what do you think this other team should do with the deadline they're like what are you talking about uh and so you know that was with experience i'm sure john will sort of all right that's not in barry's wheelhouse that's that's maybe not you know what uh that's not the question that you put best put him in a position to succeed but the game itself, what's unfolding in front of him, I think he's pretty good. And and that chemistry will grow. I also think they've both been aided greatly by having Jim Day. 
because you're taking two people new, new to the broadcast, new to each other, uh, in some respects, new to the viewer, and the viewer gets this sort of uh, reassuring, familiar presence of Jim Day, who obviously has a great relationship with the players, has been around the team forever, uh, kind of gets it. If if something comes up, you know, there's a reference that, you know, John Sadak isn't necessarily, you know, th- there was a, uh, Sadak made a reference to Barry Larkin hitting with the bases loaded and Larkin, who famously took 18 years to hit a grand slam, sort of made an offhanded comment about, well, you know, I, it took me 18 years to hit a grand slam. And you could tell like Sadak didn't know that. And like day slid in perfectly. He's like, oh yeah, I'll never forget that night against the Mets, blah, blah, blah. And it just, it, it saved the moment um, b- because J- Jim day was there for that. That is, has been, I think this year crucial, especially just given the fact that so everybody here is new. Everybody's new with each other. It's a work in progress. It's been great to have somebody who's, you know, been around, been the block and that viewers know. And I, I think respect that's been, that's been good. Yeah. I think with that Larkin point, I think one of the cool things is just having that insight, right? Like for us, like we have Carlos, Carlos, you know, you pitch in the majors. So like for us to be able to ask you questions, like you like pick your brain about things, like it's cool to have that analysis. So I'm sure for you guys, I'm the Barry Larkin of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. But I think for you too, right. As a guy, like you can tell like that, like Nick and I care way too much about baseball and we read way too much info. We, we, we I like to think we kind of know what we're talking about to an extent. Right. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. That's why I always defer to you and Nick on what we should do on the trades, what to do with money. I'm just like, I don't know, get a better reliever. I don't know. <laughs> Here's how a guy can throw a slider. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think yeah. John also really helps Barry with some of the, I don't think Barry would be as good or as passable if he was with someone other than John, because John is very, very well prepared. Like the one thing that always sticks out to me is when he's announcing the uh, the opponent's defensive lineup. He says, this guy has this many defensive runs saved. That's something you have to prepare ahead of time. And that's really what Barry should be providing some sort of context on those type of things. And John provides a lot of that, a lot of stat cast numbers, a lot of um, um, just insight numbers. And I think that also kind of, I think, helps save Barry a little bit. Yeah, I, I, they've made big strides uh, for me noticeably. Like at the beginning, whenever we found out that Barry Larkin was going to be, I was like, oh no, all these guys are going to get to meet their hero. And uh, because, you know, a, it doesn't really work out that well. A lot. <laughs> and, you know, at the beginning, there were a lot of odd moments, you know, that, you know, John would ask a question and, you know, Barry would be like, no. And then we're just sitting waiting. I'm like, oh, I remember sitting, yeah. uh, you know, sitting in yes. our group group chat like oh that was awkward and but I mean they've come a long way together and it's yeah I mean I'm, I'm looking forward to for those two growing together More I've the- never I've only done a hand I've done maybe 20 basketball games so my broadcasting experience is basically this and but whenever I've been forced to work with a partner have a recurring it takes a while I mean it just it takes it takes time to get to used to their cadence. I worked with, with Tony Pike every Monday during football season. And the, the first year I kept jumping in on him because it just took me forever to get used to his cadence. It, it's also taken me a while to kind of get used to now. I know specifically I could ask him about this and, and he's going to take it and run. If I ask him about this, that's not his strong suit. That takes time, man. I mean, I, I you know, you, you hear that, you hear that all the time, not, not, not everybody's Jim Nance and Tony Romo, man. You know, I mean, it, it does, it takes time to build chemistry. And, you know, you think of the way traditional broadcasters work, they work 150 games with each other with Sadak and Larkin. He's only working the home games. They've had Welsh in the boot. I mean, it's just, it's, it's different. Um, and I, I think understanding all that where they've gotten to now, it's, it's a pleasing listen. The litmus test for me is my wife. Uh, if I'm watching the game and she's playing on her phone or doing something else, or even watching the game, she has yet this year to say, I wish these guys would shut the bleep up. Uh, so, it, and, and God knows during basketball and football season, often as I'm watching games, she'll just go, I, I just, these guys are driving me nuts. She hasn't done that this year. That is maybe the greatest compliment that you could pay a broadcast. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the cool things Barry has too, is that and Mo, Mo, you can attest to this. He has Byron as his brother who is, Absolutely incredible doing Xavier games. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. So like being around Byron, like when I'm around Byron at Xavier games, like seeing how he preps, how you write things out. I'm like, man, like that's something where like if you, you get you more excited about Barry, like being around that and learning from that. You know, I was, uh, was there when Byron uh, first started and uh, it was, it was rough, but you know, it's, it's rough for all of us who go on air for the first time. Uh, and Byron has really, really worked to, to be good at what he is. And, and he and Joe together are, I mean, there's, there's, they're fantastic. Uh, and, and I remember thinking if, if, and, you know, Barry had done some work on ESPN and MLB mm-hmm. network and, and, and most of it, I think was studio work, which is an entirely different animal. But I remember thinking if, if Barry puts the work in that Byron does, he's going to end up being very good. And I think it's going to be interesting to see if this is something he wants to stick with. And if, if so, I, I think he's, I, I think he's got a chance to do this for a long time and, and be pretty good. Um, you can never pass judgment on somebody doing anything right when they first start. And I, 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 I would also be willing to bet that Barry has maybe been taken aback by exactly how much preparation and how much work is involved in doing this. And, and that's, I, I don't think that that's not different. That's not, uh, that's not new. Uh I, I would be interested in, in having this conversation a year from now and just, all right, you know, how are they doing now? And my guess is by then they're going to, they will have completely hit their stride. Is, yeah. Do you think Barry would go on the road? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know if it's something he's, he's interested in. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I don't know what their deal is with, with Chris and with Jeff and, and whatever they're, they're trying to do. I, you know, that's, I don't know. It's, it's been a while since they've had, uh, one color guy for the entire TV package. And and when they did, it was Chris and they didn't have every single game. So I don't know. I don't know. It would help, it, it, you know, given that he's the guy calling the most games, the more games you give him, the better. But, you know, at the same time, they have deals with other guys. So I don't know. Yeah. I can't believe John hasn't taken a, a game off yet other than the, the like three or four national games. Like that's incredible. Like he's on a, a heck of a run. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, I wonder if this was like, Hey, year one, man, you got to do the whole load. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. I don't know. Years where players like, you know, Joey, you wanted to play at 162, like just to do it, <laughs> just to say that he did it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I wonder, I guess they would put Jim in the, in the play-by-play seat if, if John took a game off, but yeah, he hasn't taken, aside from like the YouTube games and the Fox game, he hasn't, he hasn't taken time off. And that's, you know, I, nerd who watches a lot of baseball that's not very common you know i feel like every time i turn on a brewers broadcast brian anderson is not on there now he does national stuff but the cubs their guy he's like half the time not on there uh boog shambi um so yeah i mean that's credit to him and grinding every night i don't know is george grand is he ever gonna do games again is that a covid thing is is that I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I do the same thing. And, and like Michael K calls every freaking Yankee game. Yeah. He does a daily talk show, which I have no idea how, uh, how he does that. Uh, uh, Kuiper and Kruko do, do, I mean, every single San Francisco with John Miller, every single San Francisco giants game, but you're, you're right. The Brian Anderson never calls Brewers games. And he's like the main guy. Cause he's doing golf or basketball or whatever. And he's my favorite play-by-play guy in the entire country. Yeah, he's at St. Mary's University. That's right. Yes, that's right. We also have Mike Breen as a Knicks fan, so you kind of like have like the be-all end-all. Yeah, I have Mike Breen, and uh, yeah, but I, you know, Mike doesn't do baseball, so yeah, he would he would do a great job calling a, a Votto home run. <laughs> Bang. Bang! Good call. I Good call. I would be down for that. Let's see. We got anything in the other chat questions? Anything before we wrap up here today, gentlemen? Uh, I, I want to get uh, maybe Mo and, and Carlos's take kind of on the revamp bullpen. Do you think? Sure. Um, I don't want to say is it enough. I don't feel like that's kind of a you know big question. But do you, do you think it's a, a passable bullpen to 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 keep the Reds competitive? Uh, I, I think it's going to be enough to get them for for Sims and Nantone to get back. Um, And then those guys that are in the, you know, the more crucial roles are going to get pushed down a little bit more, you know, to come in in the fifth inning instead of the seventh or eighth inning, they'll come in and, you know, they can pull that starter a little quicker, put throw someone else um, in there like a um, a Sasa or um, 
I mean, I, I don't know, maybe even Lorenzen earlier than that we're normally using them. If, you know, Antonis Sims can be the guys of old that we expected. Um, and then, I mean, that, that's all you can really ask right now is just to get it to that point, get it to the, get it to September where, you know, they're within five games, they're within striking distance and we're not, you know, biting our nails with the four run lead in the ninth inning. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm getting Sims and Antone, the Michael Lorenzen that I've, I've watched uh, here since he's come back, uh, Sessa, Michael Givens, Amir Garrett. That's uh, pretty good. Uh, you know, that's, 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 that might not be what they have in Milwaukee, but for the most part, when the bullpen gate flings open, if any one of those guys comes running out, I feel pretty good. And and there now are some, some choices where it's often felt this year, like, you know, that bullpen gate flings open. Your guess is as good as mine as to what we're going to get. That doesn't mean they're always going to be effective. I, I think what's going to be really interesting to watch in this sport is just what September looks like with starting pitchers, given the, you know, already increased workload. We've already almost doubled up last year's uh, total of, you know, games made games uh, started by, uh, most starting pitchers, what impact does that have in September? And are the Reds equipped to, you know, handle whatever, whatever that impact is, whether it's a guy getting hurt, which we hopefully, hopefully, you know, doesn't happen. Uh, whether it's uh, pitchers just simply can't go as deep into games. There's going to be such a premium on the bullpen that I, I do fear that maybe the gains made by the guys that are adding gets offset a little bit by just needing so much from, from this group. Um, but again, just top to bottom as, as much as it sounds weird, uh, to hear somebody say they're comfortable with the, the options the Reds have in the bullpen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm comfortable. You're always going to wonder what if, what if they still had Rice Iglesias? What if they didn't give away Archie Bradley, but sort of within the confines of what they were working with, uh, understanding guys are going to come back and understanding that guys like Amir Garrett have a track record. Yeah, I, I, I think their bullpen is is going to be okay. I don't think you're ever going to say it's a strength of the team, but their their bullpen is going to be okay. And I, I think also people, you know, you tend to forget exactly how dominant TJ Antone was at times. We're having this you know, huge conversation about, well, who, they, who should they use in the ninth inning? Who should get the high leverage outs? As good as Antone was early in the season, if you're getting that guy back, then that solves a, a very important question. Unfortunately, it's still going to be a while before he's he's available. Yeah, I and mean, I mean, not to mention the added pressure that it puts on those starters, you know, especially the yeah. young guys. Like, you, know, you can you can see it in, in Sonny Gray already. You know, he starts getting his pitch count up in the second or third. You can see him like getting vis- visibly frustrated because he knows he needs to get six innings he knows he has to go that far. And then you try to, you know, you got um, the other starters, you know, in the back end that, that haven't had all that kind of success going deep into games and, and, and they know that they have to go deep. That's added pressure that they're putting on themselves. Like Gutierrez, I mean, he, he's been doing well going deeper into games, but I mean, he knows going into it, he's got to give six. That's what, that's what David Bell's telling them. You know, maybe David Bell's not telling them, but you know, Everybody in, the, in that clubhouse knows we need to get six out of the starter. The hitters know, okay, we got guys in scoring position in the second and the third innings. We better figure out a way to get those guys in. And it's, it's just added pressure that I feel like once Sims and Tone get back, that, that that's going to help relax everybody even more. Yeah, I, I feel overall pretty good about, about the bullpen. Um, it, it's certainly not a lockdown bullpen or anything like that. But I think – people don't understand how few of those there are in baseball right now. Um, so I guess my, like my biggest thing was, you know, today was kind of a rough day for the, for the Reds bullpen. I wouldn't, I would try to caution people when that happens. This is going to happen again. It's going to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that the bullpen's bad. It just means it's a bullpen. You saw the Padres, you know, give up three runs, four runs in the ninth and 10th inning today with, better relievers you know Rysel Iglesias as big of an upgrade as he would be for the Reds and they should have kept him he's blown five saves this year so you're still going to have those things happen so I, I would just you know be prepared for that as the season goes on it doesn't mean you know one bad night 
that all of a sudden, oh, this is a terrible bullpen. They didn't fix it. They didn't address it. Well, it just might be one bad night. I think often with some of these games, it's like uh, the the game in Chicago, the Javier Baez game, the easy target becomes the bullpen, right? <clears throat> well, the reality is they had the bases loaded in the eighth inning. They don't score. They had first two guys on in the ninth inning. Uh, they don't score. Uh, sometimes there's a, a defensive play. Like certainly I've directed a lot of ire at the bullpen. We all have. And, and there's, there's moments where, you know, there's it's, it's inescapable. But, but oftentimes I find myself drifting towards, okay, what else could have gone differently in the game? You know, they, they lost that Friday night game against Milwaukee, the, the first game after the break with the bullpen sort of melted down and uh, Mally gave up a, like a, a fence scraper home run, made it four three. And it just, it felt to me like at that point, like that was a, that was a huge blow in that game. What if, what if he gets, what, what if he gives them six innings and gives up a run instead of whatever it was, five innings and gives up three. And and, and so I, I tend to, I tend to think that at times the, the bullpen kind of becomes a, a meat shield for all this other stuff that happens within the the context of, of a game, you know, last night, again, Mally's given a, a three to one lead and he gives it back and one. So now, you know, your offense has to, to, to crawl all the way back. They did put a couple of guys on in the ninth inning. Nobody could get a hit. Um, there are there are moments like that that at times just get shoved aside because the bullpen is the obvious target and usually deserves to be but uh again there are times in which the bullpen is almost set up to fail because somebody doesn't get a hit somebody doesn't make a play in the field uh, a starter doesn't go as long as you would like runs are given up earlier when they shouldn't have been and those sort of things happen and and so if if they can kind of mitigate some of that then then perhaps this bullpen is is less set up to fail than it's been so far this year yeah it's it's like you said it's just a, it's an easy target and it's been a, an easy target since day one everybody knew what the biggest flaw in the team was and so it's kind of like let me see how can i say this without maybe hurting anybody's feelings any fans it's like go for it it's like the easy the easy target it's like the fan doesn't have to think about it. It's the bullpen here. They suck. And next thing, next tomorrow morning, they're calling Mo to tell them how it's the bullpen's fault <laughs> because they didn't do, they didn't do the, you know, they didn't think through the game. Like you just described, like all the opportunities, they're not doing that. You know, you can kind of compare that to the Joey Votto, the money. Well, he's, he went 0 for 4. He sucks. He's not worth it. Why? Why? But what about yesterday? Like they're not thinking about stuff. They just react and they put it out on Twitter. They call Mo. It's just, it's not for the, not for the thinking fan. Like they, like they just kind of just, just react. And that's the majority of fans. It's like, you know, it's like golf. Like everybody loves to golf. There's like 10% of people that are actually good at golf and can shoot under 90 or shoot under hundred. And the fans are that way. There's like 90% that just stop at that. Like, oh, it's the bullpen. The bullpen sucks. The bullpen's terrible. That's why we lost. The bullpen blew it. But no, there were so many other reasons why. I mean, that's kind of my point is just that we hear, we hear the most of the, ne- the negativity and we see it and it's just because that's it. Most fans aren't like as dedicated that, that we are and into the game, to the team, into the city and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I had- the- Sorry. No, go ahead, Nick. Mine was a joke. So you can go. Oh. <laughs> it's not that the bullpen, you know, Castellini and maybe Carl doesn't agree. They certainly deserve a lot of the criticism, but at this point in the stage, I mean, I feel like they've done a pretty, pretty solid job to address it, at least for the rest of the season. Um, and you just, you have to remember like last night, the Reds needed four innings from their bullpen. Not many teams are going to go four innings without allowing a run. I mean, average bullpen ERA is over four. That equates to, I think, about two runs over four innings, if I'm doing my math right. So it's you're supposed to give up at least one run, maybe two runs. So, you know, I think we have to try to remember that as we're watching the games. And I don't know, maybe not 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 try to to break too many things, Uh, you know, save some stuff for for uh, October. I also highly suggest taking a break from Twitter from time to time. It's really not a bad idea. <laughs> I, I need that it's, advice. It's magnificent at times. Like, man, I did it on my honeymoon. It was the best decision I made of the whole thing. I was like, how else am I supposed to once? call out Nick? <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, when people get like, get this crazy and their first thought is like, I have to tweet this. Like Carlos will say, it's like, 
it doesn't have to be that way. At the end of the day, it's sports. Like we love it. We care a lot, but like at the end of the day, it's sports. Saved a lot in the drafts this year. Saved a lot in the drafts. Yeah, I'm sure you did. You especially, because you like are like the Reds. You're like one of the big, one of the big parts of the Reds Twitter area. Hmm. Good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mo, we'll get you out on this. I'm not going to ask you for a prediction for a record, or you would, I'm just going to ask your percentage of optimism of the Reds playing in the postseason this year. That uh, you're allowed to say at least. Yeah, no, I mean, the math in the central is just hard. It's it's hard to overcome seven and a half games. I mean, you know, if you look at, at how they've played the last five weeks, they've played pretty well. They've won a, a pretty overwhelming majority of those games and they haven't gained any ground. It's, it's just, they play the Pirates a bunch. I, I just, I don't, for all their COVID issues they're having right now, I, I find it hard to believe that Milwaukee is going to go through a prolonged losing streak because of the pitchers they have. Um, and in the absence of a prolonged losing streak, I don't know how you catch them. So I, I think it's them in San Diego for the last wild card spot. Um, and you know, it would be more of a toss up if the, if the, the distance between those two teams was closer than four, um, at the same time, the schedule is somewhat favorable for, for the reds. Uh, Nick mentioned that the, the Padres do play the, uh, the Rockies and, and, uh, Arizona a bunch but this team is going to get healthier. Uh, I like their offensive makeup. The starting staff is fine. I'll, I'll, I'll put it between 40 and 50%. And that doesn't sound like much, but it's, you know, again, I kind of, I don't want to discount their chances in the central. It's just seven and a half games is hard to make up in a third of a season against a team that's stacked in the starting rotation. That Milwaukee team is nothing to write home about offensively by any stretch. Uh, and their schedule does get tougher, but it's, it's just so hard to make up that ground. I think that the wild card is realistic. Uh, that's a good San Diego team. You know, we'll find out what's going to happen here with, uh, with Tatis. Uh, we'll see if the bullpen additions can, can add up uh, and we'll see if they can stop losing these games that they really should win. Like last night. Um, I'll, I'll go in the 40 to 50% range somewhere in there, which is frankly more than I thought it would be a month and a half ago. So, and, and maybe more than I thought it was going to be at the end of that homestand after the all-star break. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way. Well, man, this is awesome. We thank you so much for taking some time and spending an hour with us. Uh, no problem. Anytime. Yeah. So everyone give Mo a follow at Mo Egger on Twitter. Easy. That'll be, worth your, that'll be worth your time. <laughs> yes. And then yes, if you are listening to us on the Apple podcast, please be sure to take us back to college five star review. That's a long way. Thank you all for joining us each and every week. Have a good week and go Reds. See you.